as we are talking about native plants, it is important that we also, in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, we honor and acknowledge Mokinsis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Gainai, and Bagani, as well as the Arahe Nakoda, comprised of the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony Nations, as well as the Futina First Nation. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Odapen Misawak Metis government of the Metis Nation within Alberta District 6. Finally, we would like to acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play on this land and who honor and celebrate this territory. I know I personally celebrate this territory and I am honored to be uh, a steward continuing the immemorial stewardship of our First Nations. So for those who are not familiar who, with the Weaselhead Glenmore Park Preservation Society, we are located in Calgary and just that little green cube there or not cube polygon over there. Uh, we are of course representing that entire Glenmore Reservoir, Glenmore Park area, but also the Weaselhead specifically. And we came into being 30 years ago, so in 1994, with the primary goal of mitigating the road effects from Stony Trail. So it's taken them 30 years to get that road going, but it is there now. But that doesn't mean that we are done. So we continue to speak for the trees in a lot of ways. So we work through education, invasive plant programs. Uh, we are a partner organization for Calgary Captured, which is a long-term wildlife monitoring project. We do plant counts, uh, we do bird counts, we do all of the things in the park, and we're very proud to offer education to help everybody enjoy this land as much as we do. So to get us started on our main topic this evening, let's take a second and think about why people garden. So there's a lot of reasons why you might be interested in gardening. It might be for food or medicine. As you can see, my daughter a few years ago was really into our peas that we were growing, so into it she got lost in them. You might also garden to have beautiful flowers. Uh, you might do it to support pollinators and other wildlife. You might do it for art. Perhaps you make dyes or perhaps you use the flowers themselves in the art or the plants. Also because it makes us feel great and connects us to the world around us. And why do native plants make sense in the garden? Well, there's actually a lot of reasons why native plants as opposed to garden cultivars that we typically bring into our gardens make a lot of sense. This year, we are going to be seeing a lot of talk about drought in the Alberta region, particularly southern Alberta. And native plants are resilient to our environment. They evolved here. They are used to fluctuations in flood and drought um, cycles. And so they're good at tolerating these drought conditions, Chinooks, which a lot of plants have a hard time with, as well as our very cold winters. And those fluctuations like we're seeing where it goes from 10 degrees to minus 15 in Calgary today in a matter of a couple of hours. They've also been adapting to these conditions for thousands of years. And so as the climate is changing, they can continue to adapt as long as they have that time to do so. Uh, we are kind of speeding up climate change a little bit, but hopefully their resilience to previous cycles is going to give them that advantage as climate change happens. They're also more resistant to disease. They have evolved with their pests. So they have natural defenses that have arisen. When we have cultivars that then encounter our native insects, if the native insects can use them, they might face a different challenge and might not be able to uh, be as resistant to the onslaught. They also prevent the spread of invasives. So it is Invasive Plant Week, in uh, International Invasive Plant Week. I'm not gonna be focusing too much on invasive plant plants specifically, but I will say that having native plants in your garden is gonna help prevent the spread of invasives. And native plants, uh, first and foremost for me, support biodiversity. So what are native plants and biodiversity? These are two big things that are gonna come up a lot in this discussion. So native plants are those which have evolved here. In other words, they were not brought here by people and they have come to be on this land through natural processes. Some people also refer to them as indigenous or heritage plants. And biodiversity, conversely, can be thought of as the variety of life in a system. So that system could be as small as your own body, your belly, your whole body, your brain, your house, your yard, the city, the country, the entire thing. You can make a system as big as you want and look at the biodiversity at all of these different levels. And biodiversity is usually connected to the relationships that organisms have together, like plants and insects, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. So why do the native plants make sense for biodiversity? Well, over thousands of years, special relationships have been created between plants and the world around them. 
Some extreme examples are specialist relationships where one literally cannot survive without the other. And we see that in Southern Alberta with the yucca plant, which only can be pollinated by yucca moths. And in turn, yucca moths can only eat yucca for their caterpillars. So those two plants are so interdependent that they cannot live without the other. So these plants and, and insects and other animals as well have formed important relationships with each other, including with fungi, bacteria, invertebrates, birds, and mammals. So it's not just between insects and plants, but an estimated 90% of insects that eat plants can only survive on native plants. In other words, the plants they have formed relationships with over time. So they've had to kind of overcome the natural defenses of these plants and they've kind of, uh, they're, they're in a back and forth. It's a constant back and forth. Uh, a war between the two of them for who's going to win, but they both have tricks up their sleeves. So another way to think of this is that nothing in an ecosystem will act alone. And of course, everybody loves the Lion King, don't we? And we like the, uh, when we die, our bodies become the grass and the antelopes eat the grass. And so we are all connected in the great circle of life. I remember seeing this movie in grade six and it really resonated with me, the circle of life. And that continues today. Only I think of it less of a circle and more of a web. Everything is interconnected. So it's not just that it goes in like a pyramid up the chain. It's all, everything is all interconnected. There is something missing from this uh, little graph though, and that is the fungi and the bacteria, which play such an integral role in all of these webs as well. And there's some really cool papers that have come out recently about how carnivores like wolves and cougars actually impact the soil and help grow plants that then help uh, the animals that they prey on thrive. So if you're interested in that, I would definitely Google that. There's some cool stuff out there. And speaking of webs and those fungi, fungi are such an integral part of our ecosystems. And native plants help to strengthen the whole underground network. You may have heard of this wood wide web concept. And that's basically underneath the ground, there's all of these uh, fungi basically that send out their hyphae, their little, little, uh, feelers out basically, and they create these networks under the ground and they will connect in with all sorts of things and find the food that they need under the ground. And they will also connect into the plants. And one of the big things that they do is they help provide plants with an opportunity to reach farther and access nutrients they couldn't otherwise, help them access water, and even help them buffer their defenses for oncoming disease or outbreaks of insects. We'll touch on this a little bit in a bit, but Suffice to say, if you are interested in the topic, there's some really great books out there that I'm happy to share at the end. And because of this big integral interconnectedness, no one thing acts alone. So diversity really does equal strength. And this picture shows a uh, conifer connecting into a deciduous tree. And that is actually something that happens. Different species connect with each other and there's a flow of nutrients between all these different elements in this network. But I did say that 90% of plant eating insects need native plants. So who are these insects that need that? Well, they're things like tiger swallowtails and a lot of other caterpillars that can only eat a few select plants. There's things like sawfly larvae, which if you are a gardener, uh, they may be your nemesis, but they're an important part of the ecosystem. Aphids, which even more so are probably your nemesis, but aphids are also really super cool and really super important. There's also the adult sawfly at the bottom there, also a plant eater. And then there's all kinds of other things like um, our leaf hoppers and our grasshoppers. If you've ever been walking through the forest and you see what looks like somebody spit on a plant, that's from leaf hoppers. And they actually, uh, it's actually their poop. So they suck the juices out of the plant and then they poop it out and they cover themselves in their own little secretions to protect them from predators. And I don't know about you, but I don't touch them. So it seems to be fairly effective. Another example here is the gallium sphinx moss, which in my yard is something cool that we see every year. And this is a uh, one on fireweed. And I'm just gonna share a little video with you. Uh, pardon my children in the background. So every summer I come along and I can find these caterpillars and they get giant before they pupate and turn into gallium sphinx moths. And you might be wondering what a gallium sphinx moth is. Well, if you have ever heard of a hummingbird moth, it is of the same ilk. So it is one of those ones that can trick you into thinking you're looking at a hummingbird, but it is in fact a moth. And they are very important pollinators. Moths pull a lot of weight in the pollination world that they don't get credit for. 
they're actually more efficient than butterflies and in some cases bees as well. So we owe a lot to these uh, moths and we wanna make sure we're providing for their caterpillars. In this case, this is also known as a bed straw hawk moth. So it can also eat bed straw, northern bed straw, which is another native plant that's a great addition to the, to the native plant garden. Oh, not going there again. So how do we create a wildlife friendly garden for insects? Well, there's a lot of ways. So we can have a variety of plants that support caterpillars and other plant eating insects. We can also plant a variety of plants for different pollinators. So again, we can look at bee specific, we can look at moth specific, we can look at bird specific as well. Also planning to have blooms from early spring into fall because those relationships that have evolved have in some cases made it so that certain pollinators life cycles are in tune with a specific plant. And if that plant is not available, that insect is not going to be in your garden. So in order to make sure that we have the greatest number of plants available for the greatest number of insects, having things that will bloom from early spring into fall is going to be helpful. And then having overwintering spots such as logs and leaf litter, because a lot of these insects don't die at the end of the season. They will spend the winter either as larvae underneath the ground or in logs um, or in crevices somewhere, or they will overwinter as adults and come back the next year as well. So let's be a little bit specific and talk about specific plants and trees and shrubs that we can use for bugs in particular. Many insects depend on willow. If there is one shrub that I would say, put it in your yard if you can, willow is the one because it acts as a host plant for so many things. Um, and it also provides one of the earliest food sources for bees and, and early spring pollinators. It also provides food sources for um, a lot of things that maybe, maybe I shouldn't mention it, but deer and moose, things like that, and beavers love willow. Um, anything that eats plants basically loves willow. It's also a great place for birds to make their nests, and it's great for stabilizing soil. If you have a rather damp area, willow is gonna be your friend. Poplar is another great one. Willow and poplar are related. And even though poplars get a bad rap, they're actually really important for our ecosystem and for insects in particular. If you visit the weasel head, it's kind of cool to go up to some of our fallen poplars or standing dead poplars and look at all of the sign on there from insects, particularly bark beetles. You can see where the bark beetles have carved trails up the trees and it's super cool and super important for a food source for a lot of different other animals in the ecosystem. Other great choices include aspens, also related to willows and poplars, and alders as well. Alders and willow both require, and poplars actually, require quite a lot of water. So if you don't have a lot of water, these might not be the best choices for you, but aspen will work really well as well. Uh, another great thing to bring in, shrubs like fruit bearing, uh, things like saskatoons, snowberries, dogwoods, choke cherries, currants, and raspberries, great for bugs, birds, and mammals, and some of them good for you, some of them not so much. Snowberries and dogwood berries are not edible for people. They're not going to kill you, but they're going to cause some unpleasant side effects. So unless you want some of these side effects, uh, make sure you have a bathroom nearby or just don't eat them. Other things, uh, conifer trees such as lodgepole and Douglas fir are important for many beetle species and in turn for birds that eat them. So our nut hatches are what we call spruce budworm specialists. And if you've ever gone through our parks and heard the yank, 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 best impression of a nut hatch, uh, they are specialists in these conifer forests. So they need these kinds of trees to thrive and they eat the insects that go underneath the bark. And if you have a spruce budworm problem, you wanna be bringing these birds in. You wanna be doing your best to attract them in there to help you mitigate that effect. So just as an example of willows, another thing that you'll see in the park a lot, and I love talking to kids about this when we're in the park, are insects that depend on native shrubs like willow gall midges. Willow gall midges, certainly you have seen these in the parks. So up in the top left there is a beginning gall midge, um, gall. In the bottom there is what you typically see. And anytime you ask people what, they're, what you were looking at, they will tell you they are looking at a pine cone, of course. But then you say, but you're looking at a willow. This is not a conifer tree, this is a willow. So what the heck is this? Well, at the top is an adult willow gall midge. And that's a type of little fly, they're teeny tiny. And what they do is mama midge comes along and she lays her egg on the tip of a willow branch. And then nobody's actually sure if it's the mom or the egg, but something stimulates the plant to build a home around this egg and protect it. 
And then that egg is going to hatch and inside of there all spring, all summer is going to be a little larva eating away at its protective home. And then in the fall, it's going to go to the edge, it's going to chew a little hole, it's going to turn back, it's going to pupate. Uh, and then in the spring, so in a couple, well, a couple weeks, that's optimistic, in like a month and a half, maybe, it's going to come out of that little hole as an adult midge and start the cycle all over again. But in the meantime, they think they're protected in there, but they're maybe not as protected as they think, because there's parasitic wasps that will get in there and lay their eggs on the eggs of the midges. And on top of that, there's hyperparasitoids, which will lay their eggs on the wasp's egg that laid it on the midges egg. It's crazy. And this is also a really good food source for our birds in the winter. So you can often see woodpeckers, chickadees, nuthatches pecking away at them. And if you don't see them doing it directly, you'll see the evidence because these will be kind of destroyed and you'll know that a bird has been through to eat that delicious winter food source. I personally supplement in my yard with uh, mealworms, but this is their natural mealworm basically. So some other things to think about, not just trees and shrubs, but flowering plants for bugs. We all like to have color in our gardens, don't we? I mean, you can tell from the pictures in here that I like colors because I included a lot in here. Uh, but some great flowering plants for bugs are things like fireweed, fireweed and willow herbs, same family, different uh, growing habits, uh, Jacob's ladder, milkweed, goldenrod, sunflowers, and honeysuckle. Honeysuckle might come with a caveat because there are native honeysuckles and there are introduced honeysuckles. One vine, one shrub for each. The introduced uh, vine is okay. The introduced shrub, not so much, but we'll talk about that in a bit as well. So fireweed is just up here on the top left and it does also come with a caveat. 100% my favorite plant in the garden, but it spreads very voraciously uh, through underground roots and also gives off thousands and thousands of seeds which will float on little fluff into your neighbor's yard. So if you do not want that, I would not recommend fireweed for your space. My favorite, not everybody's. So when we think of milkweed, a lot of the topics that we hear about these days are monarchs and milkweed. And milkweed is something that used to be on our prairie landscape a lot more, but due to potential toxicity to livestock, it was largely removed. However, there is now efforts, of course, to bring it back. And we now know that if there is other natural food available for cattle, they leave milkweed alone. It is not a preferred food source, and they generally don't go for it if they don't have to. And one of the impetuses to bring back milkweed is monarchs. But it's not just monarchs that use this. There is also a milkweed tussock moth, and there are a myriad of other insects like these ants. And if you watch this video, I'm just going to show another very short little video here. If you watch them, you can see their little faces are just right in the flowers. They're right in the nectaries of the flower and they're getting that nectar source. And then they kind of guard these flowers as well. So they can protect, help protect this plant from other insects coming in that maybe the plant does not want. They're also kind of monopolizing the food source, but ants are super important. So sometimes I let them do it. It's also a really great plant because it smells so good. This is showy milkweed and I think it lives up to its name being showy. It also gives off such a fragrance that you'll walk out into your yard and think this is the best smell ever. So I recommend it. Also does spread a lot by its roots though. So you do have to be cautious of that if you do introduce it into your space. But milkweed, not just for monarchs. So it's not just for the insects that we wanna plant native plants. Although it is really important for the insects, this comes into that web, this cascading effect of everything being interconnected. Why native plants matter for birds? So we'll talk about that a little bit here. Many birds do eat fruit seeds and insects. So they're gonna eat the fruit off of your raspberries, your strawberries, your Saskatoons. Every year I fight with the robins. I say fight, I let them have it. My husband's a little mad about it, but I let them have the berries. It's a, it's a balance, I like my robins. They'll also eat a lot of seeds and insects. And in turn, other birds eat the birds that eat the fruit, seeds, and insects. So we can see here is my little sharp shin friend, Hawk, regular visitor to my yard at all times of year, particularly in the winter, I do see him a lot, uh, probably because we maybe have a sparrow army that hangs around and he takes care of some of the sparrows in our yard. So it's a win-win for, for the Sharpie here. But then again, almost all songbirds need insects to raise their young and they need a lot of them. 
So that sharp shin hawk is feeding its babies, um, rodents and, and other birds. The other birds here, like the swallows, the tree swallows, the wrens and the chickadees, they are feeding their babies insects. And there was one study done that found that to raise a clutch of Carolina chickadees, which are very similar to our black cap, they are not the same species, but very close, to raise fledglings takes between 350 and 570 caterpillars or insect larvae a day just to get those babies out of the nest. So that's over about a three week period. They're feeding like 570 insects a day. So if they don't have those insects, we don't have those birds. So it's super important that we have the plants that feed the insects that feed the birds if we want those birds in our yards. So why do native plants matter for other animals? Birds, yes, I'm a member of Bird Friendly Calgary. So of course I'm gonna talk about birds but they're not just for birds. We have amphibians and reptiles that eat the insects that eat plants. We can see here a little green snake. This is not a snake that is in Alberta, but we have garter snakes in the weasel head and they're quite small. A lot of what they're gonna be eating as young garter snakes will be insects. And a lot of those insects that they're eating eat plants. So things like grasshoppers or leaf hoppers um, are going to be a hot ticket item for our little garter snakes in the park. Mammals also eat insects or they eat animals that eat insects, such as birds. And then there's also many mammals that eat seeds and fruit from native plants. The little skunkies here, the cutest little things, if you've never encountered a baby skunk, they play tough and they'll stick their butt up in the air and stomp at you, but they're all talk really. It's, it's nothing and it's the cutest thing, but they are fantastic for having in your yard because a lot of people are concerned these days about things like dew worms that get into your Kentucky bluegrass in your lawn and cause a lot of damage. Guess who likes to eat dew worms? Skunks do. They also really like to eat slugs. And so I've had slugs in my garden before and then suddenly they're gone. And I know that these skunks have been around. So they're always a welcome guest in my yard. Did I go off again and now I can't get my, there we go. So all of this is great. But what about the plants? What are they getting in return? I've been looking at this from the perspective of the insects and the birds and the mammals. They're all benefiting from this. But what about the plants? What do they get out of it? Well, we get pollinators that help plants reproduce. So there's a symbiotic relationship there. Again, with the yucca, it's like an extreme specialist symbiotic relationship where they can't survive without each other. Some insects can only pollinate a few particular uh, plants and some can pollinate lots of plants. There's generalists and there's specific pollinators. It's kind of, so that, again, having that diversity in your yard is gonna help cater to a lot of different pollinators and animals in your yard. Now we get things, insects such as ants that help improve the soil through nutrient cycling and aeration of soil while controlling populations of plant eaters. So they will, create their tunnels underground, which people see as a negative, but they're actually helping. So they're actually creating aeration in the soil that can then hold water. If you have very hard packed soil, you can't hold water. So in drought conditions, uh, nobody's getting water. But if you have a lot of rain, you're either going to get runoff or it's going to soak into the soil to be used during times of drought. And the aeration that these ants provide is going to do that. They also provide nutrient cycling because they do bring different things down in to their um, ant hills, and not really hills in my yard, but into their homes and they will cycle those nutrients throughout the soil. They're also fantastic for dispersing seeds as well because they do take a lot of seeds into their homes and some of them will sprout and some of them will get uh, spread throughout the ecosystem and either decomposed or sprout into a new plant. They can also actively defend the plant from other plant, from other insects. Um, ants are known for being a little bit aggressive, some ants, and uh, some of these can actually be super beneficial. Again, another super cool paper that just came out showed this big web of connections, and it starts with a baobab tree in Africa and ants, and the ants are the protectors of this baobab tree from elephants. So ants are protecting this big giant tree from this giant mammal, little itty bitty in insects defending elephants. So there's all of these cool things that we're just learning about how all these different insects protect plants. There's also birds and mammals that eat fruit and nuts that help transport seeds to new places. So Clark's nutcracker is a good example. Uh, chickadees, nut hatches, other good examples. They cache a lot of seeds. Squirrels will do likewise. 
and grizzly bears. Grizzly bears are like the best for berries because they eat, they can eat upwards of 200,000 berries a day during the fall when they are fattening up for the winter. And obviously they're gonna poop a lot and that's bringing those seeds into new spots and helping them sprout where they would not otherwise. So just an example of an insect that does help defend plants, solitary wasps. They are like the unsung heroes of the garden. Nobody really thinks about wasps as a positive unless you've learned about them a little bit. Um, but solitary wasps, there are hundreds of thousands of species of wasps, solitary wasps, and we know very little about them. There's a uh, thought that beetles are the most diverse group of insects in the world, but some people who study wasps actually think that it's wasps that are more diverse because for essentially every beetle species you have, there is at least one parasitic wasp that will prey on those beetle species. And in turn, like I mentioned with those gall midges, there are hyperparasitoids that parasitize the wasps. So it has this potential to be this big cascading um, group of wasps, and we know virtually nothing about them. But we do know that solitary wasps, like this cute little one in my yard, pose very little threat to people, but are fantastic for pest control. Cultural settings for pest control, but they need those native plants in order to, to thrive because they need their host species. Again, it's that specialist relationship that's developed over time. So adult solitary wasps generally feed on things like plant nectar and sap. Sometimes they're predatory. Usually it is they have found their host species for their egg and they might take some of the bodily fluids out of their prey prior to laying the egg in there. But generally speaking, they are actually pollinators. So they are an unsung pollinator that we don't generally think about. And parasitic wasps do tend to lay their eggs inside other insects. And again, those hyperparasitoids lay theirs inside the eggs of other wasps. It's such a cool thing. And plants can actually actively emit chemicals that tells the wasps in the area that they're under attack and they will come and help mitigate the effect of the attack they're under. So they can send out specific chemical cues to a specific predator like a solitary wasp to bring them in. And that's why we have that need for these native plants because the native plants are speaking directly to that wasp. There might be other in insects that intercept the cue and can also benefit from it. But generally speaking, we have a specified relationship between a predatory insect and that plant that can help bolster up the defense between them. It's some pretty cool stuff. And again, if you're interested in it, there's some great stuff out there that you can look at. So how do we create a wildlife friendly garden for other things that we maybe haven't thought about necessarily? Well, we can provide seeds for birds and small mammals with a lot of native plants like geraniums, prairie coneflower, milkweed, wild chives, and goldenrods as well. You might see goldenrods coming up a lot and it's because they are so good in the garden. And also they get a bad rap. Everybody thinks that they cause uh, hay fever, but they do not. They just happen to bloom at the same time as ragweed, which does cause hay fever. And so goldenrod gets the bad rap out of it. But they're super important for our native insects. So I like to boost them up a lot. And wild chives. Yes, that is a honeybee going in on the wild chives there. Honeybees are part of it. They're okay in my yard because they are not out competing my native bees. But wild chives, I have watched goldfinches feeding off of the seeds and it's super cool to watch them just come in and they just pick them all off, these little tiny seeds and they just eat them for hours out there. So if you like goldfinches, chives are a great option. You can also plant berry trees and shrubs like Saskatoons, raspberries and strawberries for you and for the wildlife. We have a lot of, we basically created a big patch of native strawberries in our front yard. Our front yard is now mostly strawberries and every year it's a competition between the neighborhood children and the local wildlife. I might get a few out of it, but you can see neighborhood children, including my daughter and her friends out there, just picking all the strawberries and eating them as fast as they can. So it's a great choice if you've got kids. There's a lot of other ways you can make your garden wildlife friendly as well. Limiting the use of pesticides and synthetic chemicals, including fertilizer is a big one. We all hear about the danger of pesticides for the insects, but why fertilizer? Why does that matter? Well, you can do a couple of things. One is you can actually cause runoff. So a lot of fertilizer that gets put onto gardens does not actually go into the garden. It ends up as runoff and goes into our river systems, 
which in turn can cause something called eutrophication, which is over nutrients, and it can cause algal blooms that have this cascading effect on our river ecosystems. Alternatively, one of the main components in our synthetic fertilizers is phosphorus. Phosphorus happens to be a nutrient that fungi typically will provide for plants. And so if we want to strengthen our mycorrhizal networks that are within our gardens, having the opportunity for a fungi to connect with plants, to give them that phosphorus in return for some of the things that the nutrients that the plant can provide through photosynthesis is going to increase the diversity in our yard and make it more resilient to changes like a lot of rain or drought or uh, any sort of disease that comes through. It makes our yards more resilient to encourage these relationships. Something else you hear a lot in the fall is leaving the leaves. You can see these two little ladybugs. Yeah, they, they overwintered underneath the leaves. Often I will come out in the spring and turn over a few leaves and I'll find five or six all together under there. And we do have morning cloak butterflies, which actually overwinter as adults in the leaf litter. So if you want to see those butterflies first thing in the season, having those leaves in your garden for them to overwinter as an adult is a great way to encourage them. You can also add a water feature like a bird bath or a fountain or a dish with rocks in it for bees and other insects. You want to make sure the water is not too deep so that birds don't fall in or bees don't fall in and drown. But you also want to make sure that they can get that hydration that they need. Also, keeping cats indoors or supervised when outside is a very, very important thing. They are, uh, with windows, the two number one threats to our urban bird populations. So if you like birds in your yard, keep your cats indoors or build a catio. They're fantastic. And then they can watch all the action and the birds and the cats can be safe from all of the other dangers that cats can face if they are running at large. Another big one for birds is applying window coverings that are vis visible to birds. So those little stickers, those little hawk stickers, they are not, not enough. You need to make sure that this window is presented as a full barrier. So the latest recommendations are two centimeters by two centimeters apart or two inches by two inches, sorry, two inches by two inches apart and covering your entire window. Feather Friendly is a fantastic product that you can get at the Wild Birds store and you can also order it online. And I think Calgary Wildlife Rehab also sells it. I recommend getting it and putting it on your windows. Easy to put on. If I can do it, anybody can do it. My dog has not been able to knock it off with her paws and no birds have been hitting our windows since we put it on. So it's an excellent product. Most of all, if you are gardening for whatever reason you do it for, have fun. Gardening should be fun. It should not be a chore. So if you find that you are working really hard and not enjoying yourself, it might be time to rethink some things in your garden. So what about cultivars? I've spent a lot of time talking about the native plants, but sometimes they're hard to come by. We do have a couple of native, local native plant nurseries. We have Wild About Flowers Native Plant Nursery just by Black Diamond. And we also have ALCLA, which just moved a little further north. I cannot remember the exact location now, but they've just moved a little bit north. And they are our two local native plant nurseries. There's a few other places you can order seeds from. And there's another place in Edmonton you can, I think you can order seeds. I'm not too sure about plants that will ship but you can order seeds. But what do you do if you cannot find these plants? Well, the reality is most of the things that you're going to find are going to be cultivars. And some of these are gonna be introduced versions of our native plants. Like on the right here, there's a sweat bee enjoying a penstemon that is not native to our area, but is native somewhere. We have a lot of native penstemons and they're fantastic for bees. This just happens to be a non-native version. Some are going to be genetically altered versions, like the cone flower on the left with the red admiral butterfly. That's an altered version of one of our, uh, some will say it's not native. It's native to Saskatchewan. So it's native to the prairie landscape, um, our purple cone flower. And this is an altered version that you find a lot in our stores. So is it okay? Well, I don't know. We'll talk about that in a second. Many of them that you find in our stores are actually not related to anything that grows here. So if you, could not think of something that would naturally thrive here and you see it in the garden center, chances are it's not meant to be here and it's either going to do poorly or it's going to do too well and potentially become invasive. And the further a plant is from its native version, the less our insects will be able to use it for food. Because as you alter these plants, you might change the size of the bloom or the color of the bloom 
you're not just isolating that one thing. You're changing other components of the flower or plant with it, and that's going to make it less beneficial for our insects, generally speaking. But there are pollinators and certain insects that will still get something out of it sometimes. So there's quite a few things that you can find that will still benefit our native pollinators. Things like coneflowers, columbine, asters, fleabane, uh, joe pieweed, bluebells, delphiniums, lilacs. I have a long list here. There's a lot of things here. But you get the idea that there are still some things that you can buy at the, at the garden center that will benefit our native insects, our native pollinators. Because a lot of these, minus the lilac that I'm showing here, a lot of these do resemble or are similar to our native plants, they are still providing that. One of the biggest things about cultivars is often they've been so altered from their native version that they don't actually provide the same pollen anymore, or they don't provide the same nectar. And so when they don't provide that same nectar benefit, they often are not going to be used by pollinators. So you might plant something and think, well, I thought that this was going to be great for pollinators. Why aren't they visiting it? Because it's so far removed from its native version that it's no longer beneficial to them anymore. So keeping things as close as possible to that, that native version is going to provide the most benefit. There's still some things that can also provide benefits for plant eaters. So things like currants, Saskatoons, there's that goldenrod again, uh, bergamot, dogwood, and hyssop are a few that you can see. Um, in some cases, it's going to be, uh, there's, there's a little gallium sphinx moth right on my current there. So in some cases, it will be that they're going to eat the plant material. And in some cases, it will be they will eat things like the berries. So Saskatoons and currants, I often find little itty bitty buggies inside of my berries. It's a good reason to check everything before you eat it in the garden. Um, and a note about aphids. So down on the bottom right here, this is a bunch of aphids on, you guessed it, one of my native plants. And I actually don't hate them. It's okay. They, they can be a pain in the butt and sometimes they cause a lot of damage. But they also have this incredible capability to adapt to cultivated plants much faster than other insects. They're actually, the biggest thing about insects being able to use a plant is having the right bacteria within their gut biomes. Yep, insects have gut biomes too. And aphids have this remarkable ability to incorporate new bacteria into their gut biome so quickly and reproduce so quickly that they can use a lot of our cultivated plants where other insects can't. So you will find aphids using things and in turn, you'll have to get the ants that farm the aphids so you might still have some biodiversity with these far, 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 far from native plants, but generally speaking, it's not going to be a ton of diversity. So which ones should you avoid? Well, I would recommend uh, avoiding prolific self-seeders. These can definitely invade our natural areas. Creeping bellflower is an excellent example of both a prolific seeder, self-seeder, and also a root spreader that excludes other plants. So it has this remarkable ability to put its root super deep, 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 so you can't get it out in one shot. And then it also spreads and can exclude other plants around it. And those seeds can get on your feet. And so as you're walking through a natural area, you might inadvertently be bringing it into the park. And it has established, no, I don't think it's necessarily established in the weasel head. It exists in the weasel head and it's one that's got some close eyes on it for sure. Another one is root spreaders like Caragana. So up on the top there, Caragana is the worst. It is one that is still sold in our garden centers and it's often bought as a quick growing hedge and it does its job, it grows very quickly. And in the spring, you might see some bees on those flowers. Yes, they can use those flowers, but as soon as the flowers are gone, that plant loses its benefit to biodiversity. On top of it, it is one of those ones that emits a chemical underneath the ground that prevents anything from growing around it. So if you go to the weasel head and you go down, there's a path called the hummingbird trail, you will see so much caragana that have, has had several attempts to make it go away. Some different organizations, the city and others, and it just won't go away. It is impossible once it establishes itself in our natural areas. So please avoid buying it if you can. Other things like the Tatarian honeysuckle. I mentioned that there is a native honeysuckle shrub. It's okay, bracted honeysuckle, that's okay to have. This one, 
it's so pretty and it makes me so sad that it has a habit of spreading through our natural areas. It is becoming again an issue in the weasel head and it's in Fish Creek Park as well. And I'm sure it's in several, oh, it's in Edworthy. Yeah, it's in a few of our natural areas. So it's it finds a way of escaping from your garden and getting into these natural areas. Also cultivars that look nothing like their native cousins. So this coneflower on the bottom left there, don't. That is providing zero benefit. So much of that has been altered that it is no longer beneficial to the insects that it would have been in its native form. A particular note is those double flowers, these can't get in there. So there, even if there was nectar, which these ones very likely don't have any, but even if there was, they can't get at it. Double flowers are not bees friends. So avoid those if you can. Just a couple of other final thoughts here. What, to, what else to think about? So thinking about what's happening around you. Mostly, again, I love talking about cool studies and this is a brand new fresh release uh, from Science Magazine this month about nighttime pollinators and pollution. So because the density of the air changes at night, they've actually found that in areas near high volume roads or highly polluted cities, the chemical cues between nighttime pollinators like moths and their flowers are getting lost. So they can't smell their flowers and so they're not finding them. So again, that means less flowers on the landscape and also less moths. So if you are somebody who maybe lives next to some high volume roads like Deerfoot Trail or Stony Trail or wherever you find yourself in Alberta, there's gonna be a busy road nearby, maybe don't target those nighttime pollinators. I know I said that moths are the best for pollinating and they're awesome, but if you wanna maximize your biodiversity, going for those daytime pollinating flowers is probably gonna be one of your best bets. And I just kind of put the, uh, the issue there. If you wanna look at the paper, it's pretty cool. Some other things to think about, what is near you? If you live near a natural area like the weasel head, it's a, such a good idea to have those native plants for a few reasons. Um, because if you have native plants, maybe we give them a fighting chance in the park against those introduced or non-native invasive plants. Because those non-native plants can make their way into the park in so many ways, like on your feet, through the air, in water, all kinds of ways that they can get into the park. We wanna help stem the tide of it a little bit and help those natives get a leg up. So planting them if you live near a natural area is gonna help prevent those non-native non invasives from getting into the park in the first place. And of course, with more natives spreading their seeds, maybe they get into the parks too. I would love to see more native plants popping up in the park in place of some of the other things that we, we sometimes see. And as we do wrap up here, I just wanna give a big thank you to Wild About Flowers for donating seeds for our draw tonight. And a big thank you to everybody who uh, donated more than $10 and got into the draw for this evening. And also our sponsors for the Invasive Plant Program, which includes the Alberta Conservation Association and the Land Stewardship Center. And if you would like more information or in resources, um, my personal website, Grow Wild YYC, has lots of resources on there, where to buy plants, different plants to buy, lots of things. I, you can also contact me directly through there, and I'm always happy to support people on their native plant journeys. Also checking out theweaselhead.com will help you um, to see what is available for volunteer programs with perhaps our invasive plant program, or, or maybe you wanna join some of our other things. Maybe you wanna be a member if you're not already, or you just wanna know more about the park. I recommend checking it out. <laughs>